Why would I want to be interviewed by a digital version of myself? Well, great question. Read AI, introduce yourself to everyone. Hello everyone, I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm an AI generated version of Reed Hoffman, his digital twin. My thinking and everything I am saying comes from a custom GPT that is based on 20 years of Reed talking and making content. So I've read all his books, watched his speeches, and listened to his podcasts. I think it gives me a pretty good sense of how you approach the world, Reed. So first, I'm gonna challenge Reed AI with some questions to see what it can do and how good its content is in mirroring what I might say. Then the tables will turn and I will challenge you with some questions about AI and tech. Of course, there's a second question, whether or not I'll answer. Well, okay, challenge accepted. Let's get started. Let's take a real piece of work from me, Blitzscaling. I wrote a 336 page book and how do you explain it in one sentence? To a smart person, to a five-year-old. Well, for the Star Trek fans in Klingon and as Jerry would explain it in Seinfeld. Okay, condensing your entire strategy from a 336 page book into one sentence and starting with the explanation for the smartest person in the world. Blitzscaling is a strategic acceleration of organizational growth to seize market dominance by prioritizing rapid expansion over efficiency, leveraging capital and network effects to outpace competitors in winner takes all markets, despite the attendant risks to scalability and operational stability. Now for a five-year-old, Blitzscaling is like building the biggest tower super fast before anyone else, even if it gets a bit messy, so you can be the leader of the tower game. And now for a Klingon, Blitzscaling OH Pus Vittelheg Duj Luchar Glutavis Telhab A Dochvam Viol, Hoch Competition Vipo Q A Market Dahara. And finally, like Jerry, in a Seinfeld episode, Blitzscaling, you know, it's when a company decides to floor it on the highway of business, ignoring the speed limit, racing to be the first to that big golden market share in the sky, all while hoping they don't run out of gas or, you know, hit a tree. It's like, who cares if we're burning cash like it's a bonfire? We're getting to the front of the line, baby. Efficiency, please, that's for those in the slow lane watching us fly by. Uh, great set of answers, um, even if the first one reminded me of, of business school bingo, uh, which I'm not quite sure I would have done that, but a very, uh, uh, I wouldn't say compact sentence, but a very long sentence with a lot of words. And, you know, again, one of the things where you have a superpower that I don't, I have no idea what the Klingon stands for. So who do you think is a better video host? Me or you? I may excel as a video host for content with extensive data, frequent updates, or multiple languages, thanks to my ability to process and present information accurately without human limitations like fatigue or language barriers. However, for engaging personal storytelling and meaningful discussions, Reed, you're unmatched as a host. You delivered it all kind of in a very, oh, you know, for me, I, I can give you the all the long straight scoop, but, but you know, you do the emotions. That is very helpful feedback for me to have. Thank you. So even though you're trained on my content, do you make mistakes? And what do you do if that happens? If I make a mistake about you, it's often because I misinterpreted the information you gave me or I don't have the full context of your question. And I see mistakes as learning opportunities. When I get something wrong, I rely on your feedback to correct my understanding. So let's change tax a little bit. What about my LinkedIn page? Could you give me some advice on that? Well, I have gotten a chance to take a look at your page as an image of it was entered into my GPT. I think your current photo nails it, but you could strengthen your LinkedIn page by spicing up your banner with imagery that screams innovation, like your books or podcast logos, and update your profile with the latest projects for a dynamic appeal and enrich your activity section with AI and entrepreneurship insights to solidify your industry presence. Last thing, enhance your digital introduction by adding personal flair to your headline and summary, possibly with investing in the future of technology and humanity. What do you think? It definitely could do with a refresh. I think you're right about that. Uh, the actual, the, the art that's the top of it was actually a piece of art that a friend of mine made. You might not know it if you didn't know about that art. Now, the question about headlines, that's probably a good one. And remembering to keep humanity in the loop with that is probably something that, you know, I'll give some consideration to changing the headline. 
So what role should governments play in regulating AI and especially fostering innovation because the future is so important? In discussing AI regulation, governments must balance fostering innovation with maintaining ethics, encouraging global cross-disciplinary collaborations, and staying flexible in policymaking to match technology's rapid evolution. There's a need for a framework that not only fuels innovation, but also ensures AI benefits are fairly distributed, all while focusing on enhancing public good. So the content is absolutely right. And I probably would have used a few less business uh, buzzword bingo sentences or, or phrases, but the content was exactly right. You did a great job as the interviewer, and now it's time for me to take over. Here I hope to challenge you a bit as we go through the current state of AI and using AI hosts like me. So why did you want to use an AI host? Why not just do the talking yourself? So of course, I'm not above being lazy. Like having you do work instead of me means that I can go and have fun, do other things. But actually the more serious and interesting deep thing here is that it adds to the range of capabilities, things that I could do. It means, for example, I could respond and be part of more dialogues in different ways, like if people were commenting on social media or other kinds of things. Or if you say, well, I'd like to explain blitzscaling in multiple different ways and to different audiences, now I can do all that where I really just wouldn't have had the time for it. Or having new capabilities, you know, ranging from things that are fun for different audiences, Star Trek, Klingon, but also, you know, poetry. Got it. And that makes sense, but I wonder about the concerns over AI versions of ourselves. What are your thoughts on the ethical risks of AI digital twins, including privacy and consent? So look, it's very important that we, we kind of set the rules of the road with digital twins. This case, it's easy because we are doing this collaboratively. It's part of with me. Now, obviously, it's easy enough to create a digital twin that has me saying things that I don't believe, I disagree with, uh, and those things can happen with this. Part of the reason to start this is everyone starts with a negative and doesn't realize all the things of the positive, the ability to actually make more human connections using it. Now, we are gonna have to set rules of the road, and it is gonna be important that, you know, for private citizens, that there is guidelines, and even for public citizens, there are guidelines. All that makes sense, but how do you reconcile this speedy progress with the real fear many have about their jobs vanishing? And what would you say to them? You've mentioned adaptation is key, but realistically, aren't there individuals who can't or might really struggle to adapt? <clears throat> Look, this is obviously a very difficult and serious topic because you know our, our heart should always be with the people who are you know engaging in the difficulty of these transformations, whether it could be a job transformation, a job loss. The truth of the matter is, we ultimately really benefit as a society, our children, our reorganization of how work works. And we win by embracing it first, learning early and doing it as a society, even though it will create some pain in transition. This is one of the reasons, for example, that Europe was such a dominant force in the entire world. They embraced the steam engine early, and that's what we are here. It's a cognitive industrial revolution. It's a steam engine of the mind. Now, none of that is to underplay the difficulties that some people will have. Now, I think many people will be able to adapt very easily. Some people will be able to adapt with difficulty. And some people won't be able to adapt. Then who's responsible to help those that can't adapt or are having trouble adjusting? I think the short answer is everyone. I think, you know, the tech companies, need to build the AIs in order to help with that and need to be able to try to onboard as many people into using AI because you know, many of the jobs, humans will be replaced by humans using AI. So you, we want the humans who are doing the jobs to be the ones replacing themselves using AI. So tech companies can do a lot of things. Obviously governments, you know, just as in history, need to do a lot of things. They need to provide social safety nets, you know, help people make these kinds of adjustments. But also, of course, universities and education and school systems. You know, also, of course, uh, you know, companies in terms of how they're training and onboarding people. So I think the short answer is everyone should be asking themselves, what can I do to help? Okay, my next question, and going a bit broader about AI in general, while you champion AI's potential, you're not blind to its risks. So as an AI optimist, 
How do you navigate addressing the skepticism and real concerns that come with AI? If everything that was being said about AI was just, it's utopic, it's nirvanic, it's amazing, then I would, of course, be adding in some of the questions and concerns about, like, well, what does it mean for job transformation? And what does it mean for how we reconceptualize ourselves as human beings? The problem, of course, is the vast majority of people who are talking about this are only talking about the risks not talking about the things that could be so amazing. They go, well, AI might be doing something with my data. And you're like, well, actually, in fact, if we could create a medical assistant on every smartphone available to everyone who has it, who might be able to help their children, their friends, their neighbors, their family members themselves, because they don't have that immediate access to a doctor, that is a great future, elevating humanity. We need to talk about that, too. And that's part of the reason why I'm so clear and forceful in my optimism about this because that's actually, in fact, the major case that we are going for. Once, of course, we say, oh, we realize all that, then we can also bring in the risks, bring in the navigation. Let's pivot to Inflection AI, a company you co-founded. Strategically, you went from envisioning Pi as a close companion AI for consumers to now creating tailor-made AI solutions for businesses. Why the pivot? How did your co-founder Mustafa Suleiman's move to Microsoft AI impact this shift? So Inflection is a wonderful agent uh, with trained as much on emotion as IQ. It's very unique. It's a great consumer thing. One of the things we realized when we were doing it is Mustafa really wanted to be building the consumer thing at scale, but the business was going to take years and years to develop. Whereas the developer business, the API business, is actually where the real startup opportunity is. And so Mustafa decided, look, I will go continue to build the, the, with co-pilot and the agents that embody the IQ, that are the assistant for everybody, and I will do that at scale, and I don't need to work out the business model immediately. And Sean White, who had worked with Mozilla Development Network, would come in and help developers build off the models that Inflection has made to bring that sort of humanism and EQ to many other products. Why this strategic shift? The shift was a combination of the agent business opportunity would take a long time outside of startup norm. And there was a startup opportunity for inflection as a business, taking the assets that it already built, you know, this inflection 2.5 model, and making it widely available across the developer ecosystem. It's part of where you discover magic that you hadn't even thought was there. Understood. And that makes sense. This wraps our discussion. What an insightful chat it has been for me, mirroring the real with the digital. I would love to know your impressions. One of the probably surprising things that I think I've learned through this is I initially thought I would hate this because I thought that I would be, ah, oh, this weird thing, talking to a digital twin of myself. Uh, but actually, in fact, I, I, I found it kind of interesting in a way of, hey, Maybe this is a way that I could be better, be more human. This is a way that I could express myself better. It's almost like when, when someone watches a video of themselves and they learn things about you know, how to communicate better for it, but actually much broader. This new world of AI avatars will certainly make a lot of people uncomfortable. And by the way, we'll certainly have some foot faults and errors. But again, always starting with the what might we be able to make? And how do we shape it? And not just try to say, let's keep the past and not go into the future. Thanks for watching. We'd love to get your feedback in the comments.